One of the big topics that I've been hearing from security leaders for this year and next is the risk of supply chain security. Now, of course, in some respects, this makes sense. There have been incidents like SolarWinds that have hit a massive number of organizations. For example, last year we had MoveIt, that vulnerability again in the supply chain that enabled the effective attack by gangs like the Klopp ransomware gang that even made kind of international headlines with their effectiveness of hitting lots of different organizations. Supply chain security has a massive payoff for the attackers. If they can find the right technology to compromise, they naturally get deployed into a lot of different environments. It's a massive force magnifier for their attacks. On the other side, for security leaders, it's pretty tricky. All of us are using more and more technology. It's being embedded in all of our different tools and technologies. And the supply chain is no longer just what we're procuring directly from an individual company. It's what we're bringing into environment in a free application that's adding in an AI XYZ on top of another platform with a plugin from someone else. This complex web of relationships can make managing supply chain risk and managing dependencies and threats incredibly difficult. Now again, this isn't an area where I have a magic silver bullet. There isn't one strategy for supply chain management that just mysteriously gets rid of all the risks. Some environments could be relatively aggressive in their supply chain management, where others can have real business problems with trying to drive more late use of technology. I'm reminded not too many years ago of going to a manufacturing facility in Germany producing cars, where they were using a set of systems, robots, that were part of this construction process running on top of Windows 95 and VXWorks. And whilst it was a few years ago, it really wasn't long enough to be kind of responsible to be running Windows 95. When you talked to the security leader involved in the teams, it would have cost literally tens of millions to stop production and migrate these technologies, making it very difficult for them to migrate to a more up-to-date technology platform from that supplier. In other instances with hospitals, I've run into examples where the supplier in question actually doesn't provide a reasonable update and doesn't allow the on-site security team to make changes to the platform. That could lead to bad default passwords, less patches being available, or purposely running legacy technology that has to be isolated and segmented. But if we ignore these more extreme scenarios for a moment, this is difficult even in the average enterprise, consuming more modern software stacks, using modern applications in sales and marketing and, and similar, even if it's supplied from the cloud. So a few things for you to think about as security leaders around the world are struggling with supply chain management and focusing on it from here. The first is, do you have a robust process in your procurement pipeline to validate the suppliers and to make sure they're doing security basics well? Are they adhering to any common standards? Can they supply you with pen test or vulnerability assessment results from recent scans that could build some confidence they're taking security seriously? Can they answer basic questions about how they'd notify you in the event of a breach and an incident? These can be part of confidence markers in a risk assessment that can tell you whether you should work with this party in the first place. And it can make a massive difference when it comes to actually handling an incident. The next is being more purposeful in the data you allow to be exposed to this platform and the supplier. I've talked previously about the notion that lots of networks are like Rolo chocolates, hard on the outside, soft and gooey on the inside. If you allow a supplier liberal access to your environment and liberal access to data, then that area that's hard for you to manage the third party risk may then carry over into a much bigger business problem. So we could think about ways to limit the scope of the data. Could we apply data kind of aging policies or data retention that make sure that over time the data is aged out so we're not dealing with all data between whenever it was in the past and today, limiting the number of records? Could we make more aggressive use of encryption, for example, so that if there is a compromise, that data is stolen in a form that isn't usable? Having security teams run reviews to look at how to kind of minimize the threat when engaging with that third party is a valuable exercise. But of course, all of that takes time, 
it takes resource, and there's an astronomical kind of number of suppliers in the average environment now. I've seen a number of surveys recently talking about how many different kind of third-party entities exist in our environment, and also reportedly that over three quarters of small businesses out there have been impacted by some form of supply chain vulnerability in recent history, in just the past 12 months. I find that eminently plausible, given the examples I started with up top. You should have a look at your suppliers and the opportunity to actually do testing and to engage with security professionals to validate their decisions and choices. All this ultimately is a risk management exercise. We should engage with it to the degree we can, very much like our own technology platforms, to understand the risk it poses to the business and to apply mitigations to limit the data or the access to interesting data in the event of failure. The last one is crucial. Assume failure. At some point, there will be a flaw in your supply chain, and you need to practice being ready to spring into action. Does your incident response process cater to third parties and to supply chain risk? Do you have the right set of contacts? Do you know who to call at vendor X to get answers? Are you clear on the shutdown process for it or the containment procedure for that particular application? Do you have a good manifest of the types of data that may have regulatory impact or not up front? Practice that process and validate that the team is able to respond in the event of failure. Unfortunately, not just in supply chain security terms, but generally, people will build incident response policies and then never practice them. That's complex enough in your own environment, but when it involves a third party, it's even more important to have that stuff crystallized and well-practiced. So run those exercises, run those evaluations, understand and quantify the risk, try to generically limit the potential damage from those third parties, and make sure you're running over this regularly. It's no good adopting something in your environment, considering the risk, and then leaving that for five, six, seven years to grow and fester and change shape within your environment. It's important to have a regular review. And of course, all of that takes effort from the security team to do it meaningfully, otherwise it will rot. Or worse, the security team will be in the business of saying no, they'll get behind, they'll frustrate the business, who may well deploy technology without your permission anyway. There's gonna be a lot of discussion on supply chain risk and how to best manage it going forwards. And of course, talking about specific parts of supply chain, specific platforms, specific technologies, enables you to get more prescriptive advice on how to secure it. But these are a few pointers to think about, and it should be on your list for the next couple of years as a hot topic every security leader is responding to, given the density of problems over the past few years.